When I first met Mr. M several years ago, he was a 66-year-old male with a history of hypertension. He had highly symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, so I did what we teach our students to do, right? You calculate his chads vast score, and because of his age and his history of hypertension and the guidelines stating that he should uh, has a chads vast score of two, uh, we know that he should be on oral anticoagulation. Our guidelines say that we do not make decisions on long-term oral anticoagulation right, based on whether or not we think we've controlled the rhythm of the heart. We should not make those decisions on how much atrial fibrillation someone has. We should make those decisions purely on that individual's Chad's VAS score. And given his Chad's VAS score of two, you know, this patient should be on oral anticoagulation. So this uncertainty about these issues, I think, has created a one-size-fits-all model when it comes to stroke prevention. The patients on the upper right-hand corner who have a Chad's VAS score of eight or nine are in chronic atrial fibrillation, take the same dose of the same anticoagulant for the same duration as patients on the lower left-hand corner, who may have a Chad's VAS score of two or three, and may have infrequent or even absent episodes of AFib as a result of lifestyle modification, cardioversion, antiarrhythmic drugs, or ablation. So can we take these patients, right, who have borderline Chad's VASC scores, who have little to no further episodes of AFib, and personalize their care, right? Create a scenario where we stop oral anticoagulation, monitor them intensively, and treat them with a pill-in-pocket approach to oral anticoagulation where we give them a brief period of oral anticoagulation only in response to a prolonged episode of atrial fibrillation, and in doing so, minimize their exposure to oral anticoagulation while still maintaining effective stroke prevention. Now, in order to realize this, I would need to prove to you five things. Right? I would need to show you that AFib is in the causal pathway of stroke. I would need to define how much atrial fibrillation one needs to have a stroke. We would need oral anticoagulants that rapidly thin the blood. We would need technology that allows for long-term monitoring. And we would need studies to show that this approach is effective and safe. So this is a study that we published just a few weeks ago where we gave 30 Apple Watches to 30 patients who had a known history of PAF and had a device in place. And we essentially told these patients to wear their watch right, for as much as they can and we wanted to evaluate how accurate this rhythm was. The first thing you'll notice is that half of the episodes of AFib occurred when they're not wearing their watch. So we're starting at a sensitivity of 50%, okay? And then even if they were wearing their watch, the sensitivity for picking up episodes of AFib of at least an hour duration is 60%. Now, because these patients have multiple episodes of AFib, the sensitivity per patient was about 73%. The good news is when the device says you have atrial fibrillation, it's almost always correct in this patient population. And the negative predictive value when it says you didn't have AFib was also very high. So the next thing we need are studies to show that this approach is effective and safe. We've done two pilot studies to date. On the left is react.com, where we used pill and pocket anticoagulation using an implantable cardiac monitor. And on the right is tactic AF, same concept going on and off anticoagulation this time using pacemakers and defibrillators. Now, in react.com, we used a one-hour threshold for going on and off anticoagulation. Now, in Tactic AF, we designed this right after the first assert paper came out, so the threshold for reinitiating anticoagulation was as short as six minutes. Together, these two single-arm studies enrolled 96 patients, has 112 patient years of follow-up. In react.com, we reduced the time on oral anticoagulation compared to these individuals' historical controls of 94%. In Tactic AF, we reduced that by 75%, and there were no strokes in either studies, suggesting that this approach is feasible. What we don't know is, is it safe? And how do we scale this to the tens of millions of people around the world who may benefit from the strategy, but are not candidates for a transvenous device, and in whom the use of an implantable monitor is not feasible given the cost and infrastructure needed to implant and receive and respond to this information. The study that we are about to launch in the next few weeks is called REACT-AF. This is a one-to-one -one randomized trial that will compare the current standard of care of chronic NOAC therapy with a watch-guided, targeted pill-in-pocket approach using a customized algorithm on an Apple Watch. The primary endpoint is non-inferiority for ischemic stroke, 
arterial embolism and all-cause mortality. And the secondary endpoint is superiority for major bleeds. The study will enroll 5,350 patients at up to 100 U.S. sites with follow-up of three to five years. Um, the study is NIH-funded, and enrollment will be beginning in July 2023. So essentially, we're going to take patients who are already on NOAC, uh, randomize them to continue their NOAC or get watch-guided therapy. Everyone will remain on NOAC for a month because we don't know when their last episode of AFib truly was. And then those that randomize to the Apple Watch will be given a watch for free uh, and will be told to resume their oral anticoagulant for one month in response to an episode of AFib at least an hour in duration. I think the implications of this trial can be important, right? We could actually help resolve this issue of whether AFib is a cause of stroke or a marker. Because if people have strokes that appear to be cardioembolic in nature with no atrial fibrillation detected on their watch, well, that would argue for the, cardio, for the atrial myopathy model. But if it's a positive trial, we could reduce the time on oral anticoagulation. And in doing so, reduce bleeding, reduce costs, and improve quality of life. And we may want to consider why we offer a rhythm control strategy, right? Moving it away from simply an improvement in symptoms and towards maybe one day a goal of minimizing or eliminating the need for oral anticoagulation.